small in our fact sheet. Uh, I know this is really small, but on our ODF fact sheet, you can really dive into this, but there are some uh, literature reports from Europe, what, what the host range is. So now we have some field evidence in California and Oregon. So I just want to stress that it seems to prefer white oaks. It, it has been found in a couple of red oaks, but it seems to prefer white oaks. Okay. <laughs> Screen froze up there. Okay, so get, again, getting back to California, where has most of the uh, mortality been observed? It's been in valley oak. And so we don't have valley oak growing wild in, in Oregon. And blue oak is also another species that's been uh, damaged and killed. And there's been one report of a California black oak in California, but this was a severely uh, damaged and injured oak tree already. So I wouldn't put much stock on that. There's, um, and then interestingly enough in California, no reports of Mediterranean oak borer in Oregon white oak. But now we have more than five, more than six, I think now in, in Oregon. So we don't know too much about this. This is a new species, a new potential pest worldwide. We only know it from its native range, but we do, we can draw upon comparisons from other Raffaella and uh, Ambrosia beetle. So here's another one that we do have in the United States and it, it's an exotic Raffaella, it's called Laura Wilt, and it's vectored by another Ambrosia beetle, curiously in the same genus as the one we have, Xyloborus. It was detected in Georgia in 2002 and has killed hundreds of millions of laurel trees and it's impacting the avocado industry. It's a real mess down there. No, no real control uh, measures other than uh, wood sanitation. There's another one, and this is Japanese oak wilt. And this is a disease that's native to Southeast Asia. So it's native to India and Malaysia uh, and other parts of Southeast Asia, but it got introduced to the island of Japan. And there's some native oaks on that island, Japan. And this uh, Japanese oak well, this Raffaella is, has a kill rate of about 40%. So it's killing about 40% of the trees that it infects in, in Japan. So those are the two worldwide examples we have. And that's what our researchers are diving into right now. So let me just kind of zoom out and talk about what are ambrosia beetles. They, are not feeding on that vascular cambium like bark beetles. They go right past the vascular cambium and into the wood. And there in their tunnels, they grow fungus that they farm and uh, feed to their young. So uh, if you're a nursery owner or a, a plant producer in a nursery, you know ambrosia beetles. They're kind of a, a big pest in nurseries. And that picture on the lower right, that's what a, a tree seedling will look like in a nursery setting that's been infested with ambrosia beetles. But then on larger trees, the picture on the bottom left, you don't see those uh, little squiggly things coming out of the tree, you see sawdust. So let's just back out to where these things are living. Uh, there's a difference. I wanna just uh, note that there's a difference in Mediterranean oak borer between the heartwood and sapwood. So I wanted to show this and just remind everyone that what's happening in the wood layer, that's the water conducting um, portion of the plant. So um, it's gonna, I'm gonna show you where it's robbing the canopy of water. That's in contrast to this cambium layer where things like emerald ash borer, a lot of our bark beetles live just in the cambium layer and they're feeding on the sugars. This ambrosia beetle is going right past all those sugars and going right for the water conducting xylem, both the sapwood and heartwood. So I'm gonna show you some pictures on the next few slides. And I just wanna remind everyone what like these transverse cuts is, that's a, 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 across the grain versus a radial cut that's with the grain. And here's a nice electron uh, microscope picture of oak right here. And so we're, we're gonna see vessels and parenchyma cells and tracheids. Remember all that from our botany 101. And these are the water conducting vessels in the, in the xylem. So that fungus that Mediterranean oak borer carries is likely growing in these water conducting cells, just like this oak wilt. So these are pictures from a, a research paper on Japanese oak wilt. This is Japanese oak wilt. And so something that's been studied for 10, 20 years now. Uh, but I circled uh, some things on the slide. G, that's uh, taken from one of these tunnels. 
And you can start seeing the staining around these tunnels and the damage on that bottom left, or on, on the bottom middle, you can see some of the physical damage. But then everything that fluoresces green is the fungal hyphae. And it is growing intracellularly in those water conducting cells like the vessels and tracheids. So on this next slide, you can see one of these vessels that it has hyphae growing right in it. And so that's that's what's causing uh, canopy loss in, in this um, Japanese oak wilt. And I'm guessing that's what's causing the canopy to wilt and brown in Mediterranean oak borer. So yeah, I just want to stress that the beetles themselves are tiny. You're unlikely to see them, but you might. There are lots of little tiny brown beetles. So not every little tiny brown beetle is going to be a Mediterranean oak borer. I just want to stress that, but they're tiny. And the males and females do look different. They have very interesting biology that I'm not going to get into other than to say they do have a complete metamorphosis. So they start as egg, larva, pupa, and adult. But uh, what California is finding is that they are attacking both weak and vigorous trees versus in its native range. This insect mostly just goes after the, the dead or dying trees like and harvested logs. In California, uh, we're getting repeated attacks on individual trees over three or four or five years. There's three generations per year in California. So this thing is reproducing rapidly. And it is flying almost 12 months out of the year. Uh, California researchers had hung those traps every month out of the year, and they have a good idea of when they emerge. Um, and they're seeing three generations, but they're active pretty much all year round. And then, yeah, the, the host tree resistance is pretty low. So they've deemed it an invasive pest. This is what it looks like from uh, the landscape level, from the whole tree level, I should say. Uh, it looks like attacks are starting in the upper canopy. In, this is from California. This is a valley oak. Uh, in those uppermost limbs, six to eight inches in diameter. And then subsequent attacks work their way down the tree. And when a Y is in, encountered, like a, a branching Y, um, that whole other branch will die too. So it just keeps proceeding down until it hits the main bowl, and then the whole tree will wilt and die. So here's one that's kind of in its early stages. You can see in the upper left hand, uh, maybe, the, I don't know if you, can you see my cursor? Probably not. No. Okay. I don't think so. I just have to describe it. Okay. I'm not smart enough to figure out how to do this, but uh, in the top left of the canopy, you can see there's some wilting and stunted growth. And this is an early stages in this tree. And then these are kind of later stages, but now you see one of these main main branches has died back and you got some other branches that are dying back as well and this is valley oak which is showing like some stunted leaf growth there the trees that i've seen so far in oregon they don't really show this stunted leaf growth but it's more like browning of the leaves during a time of year when they shouldn't be brown like in may i'll show you some more pictures here pretty soon oh yeah here's one from this is our first oregon white oak from that sandy river delta and pretty much um, the remaining live part of the, of the tree went brown in May. So that's an unusual time. And it was coincidentally discovered by Karen Ripley, who helped write the fact sheet here in Oregon for Mediterranean Oak Borer. She saw it when she was driving on I-84. She asked some of her staff to go back there. And it was our first detection of Mediterranean Oak Borer in Oregon White Oak. So we have a lot of answers. We have a lot of questions we need to answer, like how fast it's gonna spread, what's the mortality rate? You could come up with a whole bunch of, of questions here. Now, getting back to earlier here in September in Wilsonville, this is what one of the uh, infested trees looked like. It's a pretty large heritage tree. I think this one was 38 or 40 inch DBH, very old tree. And you could see how part of the canopy is dying back and the other part is healthy, it appears healthy. So this is from Wilsonville, and we're getting more and more reports from Wilsonville. I think we're up to about five or six or seven now. So I want to stress, this is where I would sample. If you could get a bucket truck or a climbing arborist, this is where I want to cut into the wood and look for galleries right there. Uh, here's a couple other trees from Wilsonville. Sorry for the poor photo quality. Sun wasn't really right right there, but... Big branches with rapid browning of leaves, while the 
other canopy is green. That's something that should really tip you off right there. Next, when you walk up to this tree, if you see boring dust, and it's specifically white boring dust, because remember, we're going into the xylem, and those beetles are kicking out all of that frass or that boring dust. You're going to have a lot of it around the trees and in the crevices and in moss. Here's some from Wilsonville. I mean, it's just all over the, the base of the tree and in those crevices. Uh, here's another one around one of those heritage trees, and it was just covered in, in this boring dust. Uh, so all that boring into the wood creates a weak point and branches will actually snap off. This is from California and this branch was actually, um, it broke off and had fallen on the ground and then someone had cut it with the grain and to see all of the, the holes caused by hundreds or thousands of Mediterranean oak borer. So it does weaken branches and they can break off too. So if you were to cut into the wood, you would see galleries like this. This is very characteristic of Mediterranean oak borer. Um, it prefers the uh, small diameter branches first, at least in California. It has this characteristic uh, branching and staining, almost looks like a trellis. Here are some pictures from Oregon, Oregon white oak. So you can see uh, it's in the sapwood here, maybe a little bit in the heartwood. And then if you cut uh, radially or with the grain, you're gonna see the shot hole there. And and something a little bit different here. Uh, it looks like branches that are smaller than 12 inches in diameter, the galleries will go into the, both sapwood and hardwood, and then um, and branches over 12 inches in diameter, it's in the sapwood only. I'll show you some pictures here. So again, these are pretty small. What is this, about six inches here? Six, seven inches diameter branch. Here's one of the galleries right here on the bottom left picture. You can see one of the Mediterranean oak borer galleries with the black staining. There's gonna be some other stuff in there because this is a dead and dying branch. So we have another wood borer uh, species present. That's not Mediterranean oak borer. But then if you split that wood radially with the grain, that's what the um, tiny little galleries look like. Okay, here's some more with the radial view or you know, with the grain. Some of them are filled with sawdust and some of them are empty. And here's a, a, a small diameter branch uh, five or six inches that I um, cut with the grain with my chainsaw. The holes didn't turn out too pretty, but you get you get the picture. So uh, yeah, again, less than 12 inches, it seems to go into the sapwood and heartwood and right about 12 inches. So that picture on the right, <clears throat> we're getting about 12 inches. You can see that there's still some getting into the heartwood but most of the galleries now are in the sapwood in those larger diameter branches. We still have a few in the, in the heartwood, but mostly in the sapwood. And so here's, a, here's bigger than this. I think this may be about 16 inches or eight, 18 inches DDH right here. Uh, you can see it's all in the sapwood all the way around, but not the heartwood. And you see the green arrows. This is a question I have. If we're gonna do tree removals, I guess that anything upstream of that, so the canopy, upstream in the vascular system from that, I bet you that's going to be green. And everything around uh, that's been, has the galleries in it should have the fungus growing in that xylem. And I bet you that's the canopy that's wilted. I, I want to find this out myself here. So again, I just show you a lot of pictures. I wanted to get burned into your memory. So uh, when you're cutting into trees, if you see this black trellis staining, especially in a sapwood of larger diameter, or sapwood and hardwood of smaller diameter, that is a big tipping tip. Yeah, that's a big tip that that's Mediterranean oak borer. You may or may not see these tiny, tiny little entrance holes, but you know how uh, uh, how much contours and uh, the topography, I guess, of of oak. It'll be hard to find all of these. It's really if you cut started cutting into the wood, but you can see these trellis galleries. So there are other things that cause wilting in oak. So I just put, let's put on our critical thinking caps when we go out there. Has there been herbicides? Has there been overwatering, underwatering? And we do have a native ambrosia beetle. And so that's what it looks like on the upper right. You're like, oh man, that looks really similar, but it's not. Once you start looking at it, they're not as branched. They rarely branch at all. And it's only in dead wood that has fallen on the ground. You're not gonna see this in live trees. 
I just I did want you to be aware that there are there is a, a native ambrosia beetle that causes some black staining, but only in, in dead trees, dead wood on the ground. So does my oak have Mediterranean oak borer? First of all, I hope you've gathered, you want to look at the canopy first. Does it show part of it brown and part of it healthy? Or did the whole tree kind of just go out one year while the trees around it are green and healthy? Yeah, that's your first clue. Your second clue is you walk up to the tree in question and do you see an abundance of white powder or sawdust at the base of the tree or, or stuck in the crevices and moss? And then three, sample that wood as high as possible on the affected stem. You want to get into where you think the Mediterranean oak borer is causing the xylem to get plugged. Look for that characteristic gallery pattern. And then finally, you can re report suspects to the Oregon Invasives Hotline. And that is the tool that all of our agencies are using. So this is used by all the state agencies and a lot of the federal agencies here in Oregon. This is a tool for the public and um, public agency staff to use to report invasive species. And the good news is that it goes to my email and to emails that Oregon Department of Agriculture, and we're all sharing real-time uh, information. And we're coordinating our field site visits and we're responding to the reporter. Yeah, this is Mediterranean oak borer or this is something else. So this is really great. Please use this to, to make your reports and uh, you don't need an account. You can just go to it. It uses your smartphone too. So you're in the field. You just go to your web browser, you type this in, and you can make a report from the web on your phone. And it uses your GPS and the photos, and you can log a report like in 60 seconds. No account, no app, nothing like that. So what are the best management practices here? Um, well, we'd like to know where it's at because this is still new. So please report. And then we're recommending that people contain it as best as possible. So uh, chipping, if a tree has to get removed, let's chip it as small as possible, one to three inches, and then uh, cover that material. Cover that material for at least six weeks in the summer and six months or, or over the winter. And so this provides two things. It provides like a physical barrier for the insects. They just can't fly out and colonize other trees and branches. But it also could provide this solarization where the temperature under the tarp, under the plastic is getting pretty hot for insects and fungus, fun, fun, fungus to survive. And so this is research that's being um, taken on right now by University of California, the solarization. And they're also looking at uh, fungicides as well. And of course, we don't want to be moving oak firewood. So I know a lot of people love to burn oak for firewood, but we um, we don't have a, a strong rule. There's no quarantine for this and there's no strong firewood rule. We have a recommendation at least, you know, me and my colleagues at Oregon Department of Forestry, we say you should not be moving wood more than 30 miles from where you intend to burn it if it's untreated. But you can treat firewood. You can sterilize firewood for insects and diseases if it's heat treated to at least 158 degrees for 60 minutes. And there are some heat treated firewood facilities here in Oregon that do heat treat their firewood. So uh, we have some resources on the Oregon Department of Forestry webpage, but California also does. So I want to just give uh, major credit to our California colleagues. They are meeting with us in Oregon tomorrow. So we're having a, a, a two-state meeting tomorrow online. And maybe I'll just pause right there because I was asked to talk about emerald ash borer, but I know this is a hot topic. And so maybe I'll just pause right there. That's my last slide of Mediterranean oak borer and ask if there's any questions. So I can read the chat here. Where do Californians report? Good question. Uh, they do have a reporting. I don't know it off the top of my head, but if you look in some of the California fact sheets, they do have a reporting tool as well. Oh, there it is. Someone put it on there. Thank you. Oh, Michael Jones, thanks for 
saying that it's confirmed in Oregon White Oak. Are there traps to put out for detection? Yeah, there are. It would take some training. It's not impossible. Uh, there are these, and I showed a picture of them, these black Lindgren funnels. There's a couple other fun, uh, trap types and they're baited with uh, ethanol usually and other lures. And they have to be checked on a, like every two week basis. But then what you're gonna get in this sample cup is hundreds or thousands of little tiny black beetles. And so uh, a taxonomist or entomologist will have to sort through all of those. So that is one kind of hard thing about that. Okay, I see Bill. I, I don't see everyone, but I see Bill has his hand raised there. Yeah, th thanks, Midas. Interesting. Uh, so pretty sure you said it's so in Europe and its native range, it's it only attacks weaker trees, but here it's attacking trees of all health status. So do they know why that they're able to attack and kill now healthy individuals? No, no not yet. Not so yet. in Europe, it has been noted as a minor pest on oaks, including cork oak, and only uh what was it, one or two generations per year. But in California, at least, where we've had the most data now, it is attacking seemingly healthy trees in in California. I don't My, know why. Sorry, I, sorry to interrupt. This is Michael Jones, um, UC Quad Extension. I'm one of the lead researchers on mob in California, so I'll be talking with you tomorrow. But I, I would say, arguably, we haven't really determined if it can attack healthy trees. Uh, where we see most decline mortalities in the urban forests. Uh, where, I mean, we could, this could be a debate, but there probably aren't any healthy trees really to begin with. And in wildland systems, when we see it, it's usually associated with other disturbances. So drought stress, wildfire, fire damage, right? So we're still determining that we're monitoring, we have long-term monitoring plots and tag trees. So we're trying to determine really it's kind of role in this ecosystem. But yeah, I would say that trees that are stressed that may persist otherwise are definitely getting attacked but i i'd still know if we have enough data to really suggest if it can t attack like a really healthy tree so one of our bmps for management you know for this insect is to improve the vigor of the tree to really help it develop that resistance or tolerance thanks michael excited to hear more about that tomorrow yeah that slide where i reported it could attack healthier vigorous trees was provided by uh curtis ewing curtis. Cal Cal yeah Fire. So. Curtis and I, he's, you know, we work together on this a lot and we go back and forth on that. And I'm not convinced, right? I mean, arguably there aren't really many healthy forests in, in the region, you yeah. know, in the North coast. Uh, so. Yeah. We have a lot yeah, to, we'll, we'll, we have a lot to learn about this complex. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, regarding traps, we, we, for us, we found that panel traps work uh, with uh, high release ethanol work, work really well for detection. Thank you, Michael. Okay, uh, Clint, you have your hand up there. Hey, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, question I had, so I know there's at least one uh, facility here in the Rogue Valley that um, is used as a like, a, like a green waste disposal site. Folks can like cut material and, and bring it there. I, I think the idea is that it's supposed to be contained to the Rogue Valley, like Jackson County, but I'm sure there's probably, you know, other people bringing that there instead of taking it to biomass. You said something about, you know, uh, transporting wood 30 miles or less. Is is that a site that we should be talking to them about or wow. maybe even monitoring for, for outbreaks in that, think, those, that? Those wood waste recycling centers are a great place to uh, hang some of these panel traps or funnel traps. And that's the strategy that Oregon Department of Forestry and, and Agriculture, that's what we use too. But uh, when I was talking about the 30 mile threshold, that was for firewood. We get a lot of firewood questions. You know, we, we, we subscribe to this thing. Don't, don't move firewood, uh, burn it where you buy it. But people harvest firewood. So they ask us, well, you know, I have to harvest firewood. How far can I move it? So we base the 30 miles on some data from how far insects can disperse normally. And 30 miles is like at the maximum, a high, 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 high end. So we want to keep moving firewood within that kind of range that some of these tree insects, these forest insects can fly out on their own. So that 30 mile uh, recommendation was for firewood specifically. Uh, okay. You probably could apply it to the wood waste too. You don't want to be moving untreated 
And that's for untreated raw, fresh cut wood. That's where we think it has a lot of these um, tree killing insects and diseases in it. Uh, Ted. Yeah, um, I was interested in a number of those photos where you were showing the galleries and I don't know whether they're all yours or the, some of those were Curtis's, but um, a lot of what that area that of the sapwood was what we would consider altered wood. And I would be really surprised if it wasn't, that wasn't showing basically sapwood decay due to um, hypoxaloid fungi. And so I guess I'm wondering whether anybody's actually looking at that at all. And, and maybe Michael has a, a comment on that because it's very reminiscent of what we see in sudden oak death where the trees are, are compromised, then the ambrosia beetles and these hypoxaloid fungi essentially destroy the sapwood and that what causes the rapid wilt. Yeah. So it's not logging of the, the pores, it's really the total destruction of the, of the sapwood. Okay, yeah, it's just uh, the pictures I showed were from Japanese oak will and that other Raffaella complex. And I did provide the reference there if you want to check out the mechanism more in, more in detail. I'll qualify this by saying I'm an entomologist, not a pathologist, but the pathologists are meeting behind the scenes. They have been this week and they will continue in the in the future here. Right, um, right. But I was referring to some of your pictures of, of your cross sections of trees with, with oak will or with, with MOB in Oregon, those pictures. I mean, those yeah. actually show clearly showed what to me was 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 sapwood decay from, from wood decay fungi, which would be different than the raffiella. Well, uh, a Keith, a Keith from a Scalin from UC Davis, he, he the, a pathologist, he has isolated uh, three or four different fungal species from Mediterranean oak borer. So they have these specialized mycangia that they can carry around propagules from tree to tree and he has isolated three or four i am going to put in the chat right now a link to photos taken by odf so all of these are um photos of mediterranean oak borer in the field and in the lab taken by odf staff and i'll keep adding to this okay well just, just the last point is the bunch i'm talking about are latent colonists of all oaks so basically, almost every oak you, out there is already pre-colonized with these. And a lot of them are native hypoxylate fungi. So the bottom line is when the tree is under stress or acute stress, then they take off. So the combination of, of insect attack, the, any kind of pre-existing stress like, like Michael might have been talking about, um, and that may actually, we may actually have multi, another class of agent in there that isn't being recognized. That's why I just want to make sure that some somebody's kind of ch chasing that down or, or looking at that possible interaction. Okay, thanks, duly noted. We'll bring that up tomorrow on our state to state call here. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, White, I was just going to point you to the chat. Uh, somebody is asking in the chat if there's any evidence for an elevational gradient. Uh, uh, not that I'm aware. Maybe Michael can answer from California, but we have such limited data here in, uh, in Oregon. This is Mike. Are, it, what is that? Is that referring to their flight heights? What are what exactly? Or 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 elevational? Like literally, like up in elevation on the side of the mountain. What's the reference there? Um, Robin, can you elaborate on your question? Um, I think she's thinking about the elevation that the oaks are at. And so specifically her her land is at 3,000 feet. And so well, I so, think she's thinking yeah. about the elevational gradient that our oaks are occurring on and if there's any interaction with that. Sure. So, so far in California, we also do not have really extensive data on this, but what we've seen suggests that where the oaks occur, the pests will occur, right? So, so really the elevational gradient, uh, uh, gradient and limit will probably be uh, where we see white oaks kind of less common. Um, but yeah, no, we certainly see MOB moving up elevations through the white oak kind of belt, right? Blue oak and Oregon white oak up in those elevation gradients in California.
Um, any other questions? Uh, we have a couple minutes here. Okay, I will say this is obviously a work in progress and we have a lot of people that are excited to work on this, but it's also coming at a time when we are finishing up surveys right now, ground and aerial surveys. And one of those obviously is for Emerald Ash Borer. So the agency staff, I would say it was pretty taxed right now and we're all feeling under the pressure. But um, for instance, I'm the only one in the office here today. We have everyone else is out checking Mediterranean oak borer and other things. And we have a ton of ongoing projects with Emerald Ash Borer. I can't get into it right now, but I'm gonna put something in the chat here. It's, um, we have a task force here in, in Oregon and Oregon Department of Agriculture is the lead. And we have about, I don't know, 40 different agencies and entities. And um, you can check the progress here. I'm going to put um, a website up here. You can check the progress and the status of Emerald Ash Borer in Oregon. So I think that's it. I think we hit our 45 minute mark here. Um, Wyatt, we have plenty of time. If you had more information on Emerald Ash Borer that you wanted to share and you have more time, you're welcome to, yeah. to keep going. Okay. Just, I would like that. I didn't know if you had something else on the agenda here right now. No, not at all. Um, okay. I'll share a few slides I have that on Emerald Ash Borer. Let's see. I'll go back to sharing my screen here. Um... This one. Okay. So oh, let me go down here. Sorry to make everyone sick. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So let's rewind to June of last year. And Dominic Mays, who is a, an invasive species. Uh, specialist uh, coordinator for the city of Portland. He was picking up his kids from a summer camp at this school in Forest Grove. And he noticed these trees right here. There are 16 of them. And Dominic um, has been educated in Emerald Ash Borer. He helped lead some trainings in the mid 2010s with, with me and the Forest Service. So he knew what he was looking at. And he reported this to ODF on that day. And in July 1st, um, our staff was able to get out there and we did confirm that it was emerald ash borer. So this is what emerald ash borer looks like under the bark of ash. And the picture on the right is nice because you can see some of the other characteristics like the wood splits, um, woodpecker holes that are going after the larvae, and then the, the exit holes that kind of look like little D's if you use your imagination. So like I mentioned in Oregon, our response is handled through this task force and it's meeting monthly, it has met monthly since August. And the work is split up among these different subcommittees right here. So it's a really good effective way to get a lot of work done. So um, my agencies, I think on every single one of these, the different agencies are leading up of these different subcommittees. And then at the task force, these subcommittees come back to report. And the task force meeting is one hour long. So we are doing a lot of work in a short amount of time. And it seems to be working pretty good, in my opinion. So as of today, this is the infested area. And look how many trees have been inspected in a little over a year. These are individual trees that have been visually inspected by mostly ODA, but some other agency staff on there as well. And um, they're is well over 100, I think we're up to almost 200 documented trees, but ODA is now, instead of reporting number of individual trees, they're reporting uh, this, the infested area. So that's what's shown in that red polygon. And there is a uh, publicly available dashboard. So th all those little gray points are individual ash trees that have been inspected by a trained inspector. And uh, if we were to zoom out on this web map, you could see that the points go all over Western Oregon. So very good tool. It's real-time data. And there's some disclaimers on there about uh, some of the su uh, uh, suspect trees and what is a positive tree. I don't, I'm not going to go into that right now, but this is a really good way to share data, real-time data. 
So just kind of looking at the Forest Grove area, uh, if you're familiar with Forest Grove, um, it's north of this Highway 47 and south of the Highway 47 is more of a natural area. And in fact, it's um, to the Tualatin River, which is one of the major watersheds into the Portland metro area. And so at first we were just seeing mortality on street trees in Forest Grove, but the more we started looking at more ODA started looking, um, it was found in some of these natural areas uh, managed by Clean Water Services, which is a public utility company for wastewater management, stormwater management. They own several hundred, they own and manage several hundred acres uh, in the Twalton River watershed. So we're finding it now in the wild uh, stands of Oregon ash. So at ODF, we have an airplane, and so we do these aerial surveys, and I flew up with another surveyor and took some of these pictures. This is what it looks like looking north. So the town of Forest Grove and Highway 47 is up there in the top of the picture. All those reds are, red stars are trees that were found to be infested with emerald ash borer, including one right there in the Twalton River. You can't see the Twalton River because the tree canopy is covering it, but a lot of that tree canopy is ash. So I just ask you to picture what this will look like. We know EAB is a big time killer of Fraxinus, and we know it can kill Oregon ash too. We know this because uh, we our trees were grown in common garden experiments in Ohio. And actually our tree did one of the, the worst in those performance uh, studies. Like uh, ni over 90% of our trees died in the common garden experiments in Ohio and Michigan. So we can expect a lot of these trees in these riparian areas to die over the next five to 10 years, 20 years. Unlike Mediterranean oak borer, we don't know what the mortality rate is going to be. But for emerald ash borer, we do. We know the mortality rate is going to be very high. So again, here's Gales Creek just to the west of Forest Grove. And this kind of shows you where Oregon ash grows in our state. It's mostly in these low valleys. And it does go up into some... Um, zoned forestry areas, but it's mostly in urban growth boundary and agricultural areas of uh, the Willamette Valley, the Umpqua, and the Rogue. So we developed a risk map here at ODF, and this is based off of some pretty good data. I don't know if I have time to go into it, but this is mapped at the Huck 12 watershed level. There are Huck 12 watersheds that have Oregon ash that haven't been added to this map, but this gives a pretty good indication of where wild occurring Fraxinus grows. And you'll see there's some watersheds um, in central and eastern Oregon. Those are actually all naturalized green ash, Pennsylvanica. So these are uh, escaped trees from the eastern United States. The eastern United States have escaped into natural areas and now, now grow in some of these watersheds. But everything to the west of the Cascades, that's all our native Praxis latifolia. So again, just showing some pictures where Oregon ash grows. It's already been highly fragmented and altered in the Willamette Valley, you know, parts of the Umpqua and Rogue. And these ash are in those riparian corridors right there. So emerald ash borer is going to be spreading along these riparian corridors from town to town. You know, every once in a while we'll get these ash swales or these wetlands are almost 100% pure ash. And they have um, kind of the unique assemblage of plants and animals. This one on the left I, is Ankeny National Wildlife Refuge, just south of Salem here, where I'm where I'm located. And I've been in here a few times and and um, spooked elk. So there's an elk herd, a resident elk herd, in the middle of the Wyoming Valley, and in, in some of these ash stands. The picture on the right is what uh, dead and dying black ash looks like from from Virginia. So this is what I kind of expect our ash forest to look like in the future, unfortunately. So what happens now? So we know that it's been in forest growth for at least five or six years. And ODA has set up a control area for emerald ash borer. And that control area is basically Washington County. It's all of Washington County. And we do have some management options, but they're pretty limited. One is biological control, which is a safe and um, effective way to provide some top-down uh, population control on emerald ash borer. So three different species have already been released here in Oregon. These are species that have been researched and approved by 
the USDA to be released across the United States. And so this is a tool in our tool bag for integrated pest management, is biological control. And the state agencies are, um, are tasked with implementing IPM. So we have to, if there's a biological control agent, the state has to use it. And we ODA has done it. They've released three different species. And then you can provide individual tree protection through systemic insecticides. The best is imamectin, benzoate, which if applied at the right time, can provide over 95% protection to an individual tree. So very, very effective. The downside, one of the downsides is you have to uh, make repeated applications every three years or so. So what else is our lead agency ODA doing? They've um, established this ring of fire and this is a proven technique to slow the spread of, of EAB through ash forests. And uh, this is, if humans don't move it, <laughs> if humans don't move it in solid wood, this is a known way to kind of slow the spread and get communities time to prepare and get marshalling yards and get contractors lined up before the devastation comes to a community, we can slow it down. And ODA has done an excellent job this, in this first year. They've selected trees to girdle. That's that top picture on the right. Makes a tree super, super attractive to emerald ash borers in the area. They get drawn into that. And those trees are now going to get cut this fall. And we can actually assess the population by looking under the bark at sections of those girdled ash trees. So I think there's about 140 girdled ash trees around Forest Grove. And then about an equal number of trees have been injected. So these are uh, nearby trees to the girdled trees. So uh, they will kill any spillover that goes into the neighboring trees. And then some trees have been selected by local agencies um, to be preserved um, for seed banks or just because they're in a special location. So here's what that ring of fire looks like. ODA has gone around and got uh, permission from all these individual private property owners and public property managers to do these studies, um, to do this slow, slow ash mortality. So there's where the 140 or so girdled trees are and about 130 or so uh, injected trees. So what's that quarantine? What's that control area? Basically, it's no movement ash material outside from within Washington County to outside Washington County. And you can get an exception, but you have to do some special things. You have to sign this agreement with ODA and you have to do one of these treatments right here. Eventually you have to treat the wood by chipping it, heat treating it for like firewood, uh, debarking it and removing one inch of sap wood, um, burying it, burning it or making forest products out of it. So why, why not move ashwood? You said it lives in this cambium layer. Can't we just debark it? Well, actually, it spends a significant amount of its time in the sapwood. Right at the end of its larval development, this dang critter, I wish it wouldn't have done this, but right before it pupates, it decides to go into the sapwood and just kind of hang out there for months and months. And then in the spring, um, when temperatures rise, it does finally pupate for a few weeks and then an adult emerges. So it's spending a significant amount of time in the sapwood, unfortunately. And that is how it's been spread across the United States because ash makes very good firewood. And so uh, ODA is saying to avoid moving ash period during that adult flight period. That's when the adults are flying around, finding new trees, mating. But then after October 16th, that's when it's okay. It's least risky to move it around. As long as you process the wood before May 1st, processing the best is chips, but there are other things. That ODF, we did, uh, we are helping ODA. We're helping fill in the cracks. And one of the ways we're doing that is by doing this interagency trapping. It's really neat. We got uh, the traps from APHIS and we have this survey one, two, three form and ArcGS online. We provide that to local governments and property owners. And if they want to hang traps, we give them everything they need, all the instructions to hang a trap, how to monitor traps. And then they report their data to us through uh, Esri Survey 123. And so this is what it looked like this year. I'm sorry, it's kind of small, but it's 140 traps total between green traps and purple traps. And uh, so a lot of traps put out there by cooperators um, and no EAB found on any of them on any of the traps so far. So the bottom line is it seems to be 
contained to the Forest Grove Cornelius area. We're not catching it anywhere else, luckily. And um, ODF is still setting up these long-term monitoring plots. We have three of these set up now. Here's two that are closest to ground zero. We have one in Eugene as well. But we're looking outside that 15 mile radius. We're looking over the next five to 10 years. Um, we're looking at how EAB comes into a natural stand of ash, how, what its mortality dynamics are, uh, and that sort of thing. So we have these monitoring plots. I just want people to know where we're observing trees, we're taking aerial imagery with drones, and we're recording what the initial stand looks like right now before EAB comes in and then as EAB moves through these stands. And finally, I just want to say thank you. You know, I love oak trees as well. My daughter on the right, her name's Oakley. You know, she was named after the oak woodlands, not the sunglasses. And uh, so I have a special place in my heart for all things trees and especially oak. And I just want you to know that I'm going to do the best I can to get you the information that you need on the ground to help you manage oak trees. But together, I know we can find a solution to this. So I'm really looking forward to meeting with Michael and the Californians tomorrow. And then in October, we're having an Oregon specific planning meeting with Oregon Department of Agriculture, Forest Service, USDA APHIS, and, and some other agencies. So we're working hard behind the scenes to try to get the information out to the people that need it. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation, Wyatt. We can open it back up to the questions. Um, but I was just gonna add, just keep us posted as to how you see um, anything that we can help with as these oak partnerships. And I know most of the partners here today are also working um, in a lot of areas with ash and, and have a emphasis on a lot of different tree species. So if there's anything we can do to help you get the information out or um, anything like that, keep us posted. And I'm sure we will be staying abreast of um, all of the progress that you guys are doing, as well as the partners in California. Okay. Thanks again for inviting me. I'm putting a couple links here in the chat. That last one I put is the EAB dashboard. And then I'm going to put one last one, and that's the Oregon Invasive Species Hotline. And so thank you very much again. Um, so our meetings typically last an hour and a half, and um, we can move into kind of a round robin. Wyatt, are you available for more questions if people have them, or do you have a hard stop? No, I'm available. Well, this is definitely our priority for today. So if anybody wants to continue the dialogue, um, are there any more questions? Well, with that, um, thanks again, and we will shift gears a little bit here and stay in touch. I have a quick question. Sorry to be yeah. sort of slow. Um, did you say, uh, or do we know how the MOB was introduced? No, that's a very good question. And there's some some things we just are we don't know yet. One of them is how it got here to North America in the first place, but. There's only two main pathways, and that is through solid wood material, raw, untreated oak wood, let's say, coming to, to North America. And the other is through the live plant trade. I mentioned that ambrosia beetles are pests of, of tree seedlings. So in the nursery trade, believe it or not, we're still like kind of shipping worldwide plants in different stages. So it could have come over on a live plant or it could have came over to North America in solid wood. Okay, thank you. Welcome. All right, any other questions? Okay, we have a, a larger group here than usual. And so what we typically do at our quarterly meetings is open the floor up to round robins. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do that, and then as I'm doing that, I'm also going to put um, some links in the chat about Quamasis Q Oak Network for those of you who might be less familiar with us. Okay, anyone have anything for the good of the group?
No problem at all. Um, I'm not seeing any hands. Am I missing anything? Okay. Um, for those of you who might be new to the partnerships, can I see um, a show of hands of anybody who's interested in learning a little bit more about Quezon or UOP? Um, Steve and I would be happy to provide some more context and slides it's a, if it's of interest, but we also don't want to keep anybody uh, from their busy schedules. Is anyone interested in that today? No problem. Um, with that, I think that I'm going to propose our last couple quarterly meetings ended um, about within an hour. And so in the hopes of getting even greater attendance, I think I'm going to shorten these from an hour and a half to an hour um, so that they fit better into everybody's calendars. And I don't think we know what our next, next um, topic is going to be for our next meeting. And so you guys will see that coming out uh, in advance on those two listservs. And so I did see a number of emails were put into the chat and I'll make sure and download those today. And most likely if you didn't specify, you're gonna get added to both Quezon and Umpqua. And so if you get added to something you don't want, just let Steve and I know and we can definitely change that again. Um, with that, um, does anyone else have anything? Thanks so much for joining us today um, on this important topic. And thanks again, Wyatt, for your presentation. We really appreciate your time and this learning opportunity. Steve, I saw you on mute. Did you have something? Nope. I was just going to say thanks, Jamie. And uh, that was really informative. A little depressing, but informative. <laughs>